Hi, Joe Derrick here for Michigan Afield. It's an awful cold and blustery day outside for a middle of uh, April day. But we're over here at the entrance to the Wolf Lake State Fish Hatchery, just a little west of the outer limits of Kalamazoo, Michigan. We're over here today to uh, take a walk through the fish hatchery, to the visitor center, and show all the sportsmen of Michigan exactly where a lot of their license money is going. So join us for a fun day. It's a great place to take the family. It's a great educational opportunity, and you'll learn exactly where all of your license money is going. So spend a day with us here, and take the right to and show everything that's really love you. Hi, I'm Joe Derrick from Michigan Afield. We're here just outside of the Kalamazoo city limits at the Wolf Lake State Fish Hatchery, which is run by the Department of Natural Resources. This is Russ Lincoln here over at my left. Russ, Hi. how are you? Hi. Russ is going to take us through the warm water and the fresh water methods of raising many of our game fish here in the state, right from egg right up until adult. We're going to go with him through the hatchery and let all of you sportsmen know just where your fishing money and your license money is going to. We'll start out right here first. We're looking right here at some purebred muscular eggs. They hatch in about 12 or 14 days. And just as they get ready to hatch, we put them in a wash basin. Let me show you a wash basin. We put them in a wash basin, and we warm up the water 10 degrees, and they all hatch in the next hour. Now we'll move down the line to some walleye eggs. eggs that are taken here, you, you receive those from fish that are netted in our rivers at, at fish weirs, or are they taken right here from adults in the hatchery? These are lakes. These are fish. The adult fish are netted from lakes and rivers and brought here, and we take the eggs from them here right in the back to them, and then when we bring another load, we take those back to the river and let them go. We can do that with the uh, pipe, northern pipe, and with the musk ones. Uh, the walleyes we do on flight right up at the Mosquito River and we let them go. Uh, some, some fish like the salmon are at the end of their life and it's a little different story. There's three great ways to take eggs and fish. We can squeeze them out of the fish, we can remove them surgically, or we can inject air into the body cavity and it, it puts pressure on the ovary and it spells the eggs in a few seconds. You have uh, uh, the hybrid muskie here, the tiger muskies? Yeah, we've heard a lot about the hybrid, hybrid muskie, the tiger muskie. Do you have those here at the hatchery yes, also? Yes, we do. We'll take, we'll take pike and muskies and take the eggs and sperm from them either way, male or female, either way. They look just like this, and it's almost exactly the same procedure once you've done the uh, fertilization of the eggs. The result is similar to what you get when you cross the donkey and a horse. It's sterile, but cannot reproduce. Do they grow any faster? They grow a little faster. And they bite a little easier, and our fishermen like that. But they'll still live to be uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old and get to be fit. Stretch is over 50 pounds. Good. What, what does this thing do? What's happening here in these yards is this pipe goes down through the center of the egg, and the water comes out the bottom of the pipe to let the water filtrate up slowly through the egg. Nice, cool oxygen. Thank you. 
Cooper. These lighter colored yellow eggs here are purebred muscalunge eggs, and they take about, about 12 to 14 days to hatch at about 52 degrees. Over here are part of our 100 million walleye eggs that we took. They take about 14 days to hatch. And they were light yellow when they were first taken, but you're looking at some that are darker, probably in about their seventh or eighth or ninth or tenth day, and they'll get darker and darker. And then in this whole apparatus here for the walleye eggs, we have a pipe system so that the little walleyes swim right up out of there and flow over in another tank over here, which we'll look at in a moment. But we, for the muscle-lunge eggs, we operate differently. At about the last day when they're going to hatch and they've gotten dark, we put them in a little tray, like a wash basin, and we make the water 10 degrees warmer, and they all hatch within an hour. I'll just show you what this is. Here's one of those trays that we put them in. Put these eggs in when they're just about ready to hatch and they've gotten real dark. Put them in here, warm the water up, and they all hatch in an hour. Here's, these have already been used. Probably we'll go on to the next thing now. Russ, how many years have you worked here at Wolf Lake? Well, I've just been here since 1983, but before that, for about 20 years, I was a field management fisheries biologist. I, I worked up in the Mayo area and in the Grand Rapids area, and then came here to the Wolf Lake Hatchery to operate the visitor center. These little walleyes right here, they were these eggs were taken on the 31st of March, and today is the 14th, 15th tax day of April, and they're just beginning to hatch right here. We can see little tiny newly hatching walleye just zinging up off here. We call those swim up drive. They'll swim up here, spill over here, and go out here, and end up in a great big round vat. When there's millions of them in there, we'll have our field people from the districts come in and take back millions of those little fry to put in ponds where they'll raise them from the fry stage up to the fingerling stage, about two or three inches long. The walleye is one fish that we have never learned to cultivate entirely on an artificial diet. So we have to feed it living little food, which we're not able to do here handily at the hatchery. And again, the white eggs on the top are again the fungus eggs or the eggs that haven't hatched at all? The ones that didn't get fertilized, usually. Yep. Well, they'll get siphoned off. for us that is attached to these fish for a particular time? Yes, and it's a very short duration yolk sac for a walleye. It only lasts about three days. And at three days, you have to have them in an environment where they have other living food to attack and eat. Because shortly after that, they will start eating each other. And they will just die in large numbers, hanging on to each other. So they need to have an immediate, almost immediate source of living food to feed on. Is there a particular live food that they're given? In the ponds that we put them in, those ponds have been uh, op managed in such a way so that they're just teeming with little living members of the crustacea, which are relatives of the lobsters and crayfish, called by school kids daphnia or water fleas, and uh, that's their food for those first uh, two or three months in our in our brewing ponds, which are located all around the state, all around the state of Michigan. are tiny. When we uh, remove them from here and take them to those ponds out in the field, we put 50,000 in a plastic bag at one time in three gallons of water, add oxygen, and tie a tight and then tie a tight little rubber band around that bag, put it in a styrofoam box to keep the water cool. And that's good for 14 hours of travel time, long enough for us to take them even to ponds in the Upper Peninsula. Is there a high mortality rate on fry this size when they're put out in the burning pond? Pretty high. 
probably it probably ends up being close to 50 percent on walleyes. And the walleyes again are one of our warm water species. They're one of our warm water species. They're a fish that lays lots and lots of eggs. As I mentioned, in one quart of them would be a hundred thousand or more eggs, and so. Fish that lay less eggs usually have higher survival, like the trout and salmon. And their eggs are a lot bigger. They show up pretty good, do they? They're kind of neat little buggers. The eggs that we collected, the hundred million eggs that we collected this year, from uh, adults from the Muskegon River took about 600 adults to provide that many eggs for us this year. Okay, the eggs collected were Muskegon Lake? Uh... No, it's way up by Croton Dam. Oh, okay. And uh, we have a man up there that has voluntarily loaned us the use of his pond. And as we catch the adult group stock, place them in his pond. Then we, when we get a big batch of them there, go up and spawn them, take the eggs from them, and release them in the river. Release the adults back into the river when we get done with them. Walleye eggs are interesting for one more reason, in that when you first take them, they are very adhesive. And we have some clay particles that we mix in the water and it coats each egg. If you don't put that on them, instead of looking like this in the jar, there'll be great big globs of gelatinous material all hanging together. And you'll have a terrible mess on your hands. So we learned years ago to do that. What, what did you mix again with the eggs? It's called Fuller's Earth. It's a type of fine clay particle which coats each egg so it won't stick to its fellow eggs. That lets us let them free, free moving and keep separate. It's important that they have oxygen around them all, right? Yes. This is like those other, the water's coming into this on the end of the pipe, which is way down in the middle here. And there's constantly water passing up through these eggs and then spilling out the back side right there. Okay. What, what do we have over here in these trays? These are called heat incubation trays. Now we've already seen some of the hatching jars with a pipe down through the middle. The heat incubation trays work by the water trickling down through a whole stack of them. I'll pull one of them out here. In these, we generally incubate our larger type eggs, like the salmon and the trout. The steelhead again are uh, our cold water fishery fish. The steelhead are cold water because they're really rainbow trout. probably have about 10 to 15,000 eggs in it. You can see some of the eggs here are light colored, they're real white scattered. Those are dead eggs in here, but the nice pretty yellow ones there are live eggs. And we'll uh, hatch. The incubation period for a steelhead egg is just roughly about 29 days. Then they'll hatch, and when they hatch, they'll stay right in the tray for another two and a half weeks while they absorb their yolk sac. And then when they first hatch, they look like little tadpoles with a big yellow belly. And then in about two and a half weeks, they'll look dark and nice and sleek and slim and racy, just like regular little fish. At that time, we'll move them out in the race in the indoor raceways, and we'll immediately begin feeding them the next day. These again are the eggs that all of our steelhead fishermen tie into uh, egg sacks. That's right. Or spawn sacks or individual eggs. Excellent. Yep, they're an excellent bait also to catch steelhead with. And some of them are using them for the little spawn sacks to catch brown trout out in the, along the surf casting and off the piers along the Great Lakes. I hear they're having pretty good luck over Lake Michigan here. And the steelhead trout is classed as an anadromous fish? It's an anadromous fish. Anadromous meaning truly that it is a saltwater fish that's, that sends a freshwater stream and spawns. 
Now, we use the term a little loosely in Michigan because they're coming from a big freshwater lake like Lake Michigan, and they're coming up a freshwater stream. So it's not truly anadromous. So I'd say they're migratory here. We still use the term anadromous, though. How many eggs do you figure you have here in the hatchery today? With the steel head? I have to check on that. Okay. What they're saying right now. Let me close this up. Uh, eggs that we're looking at like this, we can take a little longer because as eggs, they don't use a lot of oxygen. When they're newly hatched, then there's an awful lot of little bodies in there. The water's not moving through them while the tray's pulled out. And you only have a few minutes, we only have a few minutes to work on them, pick on out dead eggs, and then we must get the cover back on, put them on, and work on another one. We can't leave them out more than five or ten minutes. many and I would suspect that we have the amount of eggs that it will take us to raise roughly a million uh, let me see roughly uh, roughly a million fish to be planted next year each year our goal is here is to raise roughly about one million to yearling size so we probably got uh, percentage above that, like we've got maybe 110 million or 120 million. And, but they also may have some extras in here that are, because we do some, uh, sometimes other states will give us things we don't have and we'll give them something they don't have. So I'm not sure, that's why I don't know how many we have on hand right now. Muskies. Those are some of the little cross between a purebred muskie and a northern pike. And we looked at those yellow eggs, and the tiger muskies would have looked just like that. They're eggs, and they hatched in about 12 or 14 days. And then we bring them back in these trays, these heath trays, and let them absorb the yolk sac for about seven days. And then we're, we're just kind of sorting the, the residue and the, the litter of the dead ones that out and cleaning them up. And then they'll take these out, take them out in the raceways, where we will raise them on an artificial diet. And this is a new breakthrough to do this with these very, very predacious type of fish, which usually demand to be fed up, have other little fish to eat. They're very cannibalistic right after hatching? They are very quickly that way. Probably within about 10 days or so, 5 to 10 days.
through this opening and down over into this little raceway or runway which has running water in it. And the baby fish can then make their way down along through these raceways and then they come over around the back of the other raceways, down through those tubes, and they come down into these holding tanks right here. And then the baby fish are allowed to go into this tank, down into this water tube, and they travel down through here and down into this collecting or holding tank right here, where the fisheries people can come in and net out as many fry as they need to stock in some of the lakes. and last year for the first time purebred muskies entirely on an artificial diet. These are the feeders right here and we're able to with the automatic timer devices trip the food and drop it on them about every 10, 10 minutes and that food dropping constantly on them they'll react to it and go and attack it thinking it's a little live piece of food going down there and they get used to it. If we could look at each one closely uh, we'd see that every one of their little bellies is just bulging with food. And if they're not bulging with food and we quit feeding them for about two hours, they would begin to cannibalize on each other that quickly. And you can see there's a fairly dense population in this tank. There's about 100,000 fish in each tank here. And our goal is to finally have, because we'll have some mortality, there'll be some mortality and they'll do some eating each of each other. And our goal is to have 200 
housing end up with that for planning purposes. On this particular diet, is their growth rate uh, really well? Extremely rapid. It's so rapid that if you're gone three days and you're one of the workers that works around here, you come back in here three days, you can notice a definite expansion in the size of each one of those fish. I'll get that out some of these. And little northern pike and the little muskies so rapidly become identifiable as those fish. Anybody that knows those, the sportsmen who know those types of fish, know they have a big duck-like bill and they have those big teeth. Well, that duck-like bill and their general overall body appearance becomes very apparent rapidly. Within 10 days after they hatch, they look identifiably like little northern pike. I know with us walking through here, looking at them and taking a close look, I mean, they're obviously northern pike. Yes. And you notice they're all sitting still. It is the habit of the pike and the muskies to lie in wait and wait for some little creature to come by and then they'll pull out and start following it and they'll get close and they'll grab it. And uh, the kids that come in and watch these, they're always, uh, here's one eating another one right here. Uh, they're always startled to see that uh, they're all laying still. What's wrong with them? Well, that's just their habit. They lie and wait back in the weeds, waiting for some, when they get bigger, waiting for some fish to come by, and then they'll pull out, start going after it, get close enough. And also, the whole pike group of uh, fish have the best acceleration of any of the fishes that we have in our Michigan waters. They're able to start from a dead stop, and they're usually successful in about 70% of their strikes on their prey, other fish, whereas a bass is successful only 25%. The bass has the advantage that he can right himself and make another attack quick when he misses. And the pike, he got a big, uh, got to do quite a recovery before he can do it again. I'll pull some of these out here. These have been in here about a week or so here now. Well, I can even notice here on the bellies that they're extremely round and full. Like they've swallowed small BBs. Yes, just full of that. I'm going to drop these back in here now. But what happens with northern pike is that in about one month's time, they go from newly hatched fry to about three inches long in one month. And they'll be about, oh, not quite as big as your little finger, but the extremely rapid growth rate for that first month. And uh, then they're ready to, uh, well, we raise them a little bigger now in this artificial diet. We do a program and raise them a little bit bigger. Is there a particular time in their life as a fry that you'll cut off this artificial diet as opposed to, say, feeding them something else? Or? We'll feed these an artificial diet up until they're about this long. And that's a, that's a change from the way we used to do it. Because it used to be that... Way we could, there that, that sound and that tripping of the food just happened right there in front of you. The way we used to raise pike traditionally was in marshes and uh, put the broodstock in, let them lay eggs. The eggs would hatch in 12 or 15 days and then they would, in those ponds would be little micro living uh, zooplankton, meaning little animals, and they'd feed on those and about one month later they'd be the size of about three inches long and a, a quarter of an inch wide or so. And then we'd drain the marsh back out in the lake, and then they, from that time on, the diet would change from little macro crustaceans, the little zooplankton creatures, they'd change to other fish, and they'd start feeding on those other fish. I noticed when we heard the snap of the feeder that some of the fish started immediately to hit the surface of the water. You'll notice as the food dropped down, you see them snap. You'll see them jerk and snap down through there. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. It's not a whole lot of movement, but you can see the head the head snap and the body snap as they pick up the pieces as it goes by. And about a half an inch, they sometimes maybe have to go, but they'll grab that food. And every one of their bellies is just full. If one doesn't have a full belly and he gets hungry, he'll eat his, his uh, fellow sibling, uh, who maybe is just a fraction shorter. Like one that's... Uh, Three quarters of an inch long, you take one a half an inch and swallow it whole. I'll put some in the bottom of the tub here and we'll get a little guy right here. Stone for 
that. I think you're even going to be able to spot that they got a little bulging belly full of food. Every single one of them. Yeah, everyone has a rounded belly. Every single one. And see they have the, a characteristic see this, duck type bill. See this little runt over by me? Yeah. He hasn't got a very full belly. He would soon be eaten by one of those, that big one over there. One of these down here would eventually grab him, and that'd be the end of him. He'd be, and every time they eat one, eat, a, eat one of their fellow siblings, uh, they really make a big spurt in growth. And later on, we have to do some uh, culling out and picking out those who have become um, cannibalistic on their fellow siblings. So to get the maximize out of a hatch, you have to uh, sort them according to size. Yeah. So the mortality rate's a lot lower. Later on, we do have to do that. So we've taken a uh, little northern pike all the way from the eggs. The eggs of the northern pike, the uh, muskie and the tiger muskie being very similar in the length of uh, incubation. And uh, hatched them, let their yolk sac absorb for about seven days, and then bring them out into tanks and rear them. And uh, we'll rear them up to about this long, and then they'll be re released. And our goal is about 200,000 these to release in the Michigan waters this year. This is a pan full of, uh, this is a pan with some purebred musky eggs. We do this with the pipe, the tiger muskies, and the purebred muskies. Are these, this is the Great Lakes muskie? These, no, these are just purebred muskies. Pure not the Great, Great Lakes muskie, just okay. the purebred muskies. Next is what we call the Northern muskie. Northern muskie. And uh, with all of those pike family type eggs, on about the day they're going to hatch, we put them in a tray like this, into a wash basin, and we warm the water up about 10 degrees. And when we do that, all of the eggs hatch in about within the next hour. And uh, a lot of these have hatched now. And I think, I think we'll see some swim up there. See them swimming up there? Oh, yeah. This is fun for the kids. The kids just love to come in here and, and uh, watch those eggs hatch so fast. I'll take a little bamboo like that, sometimes up to let them see that, a whole fat full of flow. And it's just a matter of increasing the temperature. Yeah. A few degrees, and they all pretty much hatch at about the same time. Boom. And then they're placed back in those trays and allowed to absorb the yolk sac for seven days. And then they are put out into the raceways here and they're fed the yeah. artificial diet. Yes. Yeah. Michigan Fish Commission in 1873, and within a year, 
where they had the first hatchery built at Pokagon down in Michigan. And eventually they ended up with about 17 hatcheries. We're down to six hatcheries now that are pretty highly efficient, good hatcheries now, serving the needs of our fishing public. But you know, as the years went by, the emphasis changed from commercial fisheries to sport fisheries. And so now we raise those fish that our sportsmen would be most interested in. There's just too much competition, there are a lot of fishermen in the state, and the natural supplies of fish just couldn't keep up with the amount of fish being taken. And man's effect on some of the waterways was, to the, the effect was that uh, they had lost their ability to naturally reproduce in certain waters. Or, or their water. areas to reproduce. Degradation. Those areas have been destroyed by some of mankind's activities. Farming. So dams, things like that. Dams. They couldn't get to where they had spawned before. Agricultural practices that sedimented in some rivers, different things like that happened. And so we just kind of took over that aspect of the, of the job where they couldn't actually reproduce. We do it and turn them loose in the public waters. So without a facility such as this, uh, we just wouldn't have the quality fishing that we've got in the state right now. That's right. We sure have an abundance of fishing and a variety of fishing, and we're blessed with a marvelous array of water. Uh, more fresh water than any other of our states. Hi, we're outdoor at one of the uh, grayling ponds where the grayling are raised. These are the fish that have made uh, some of the areas of Canada and the Northwest Territories famous, and now they're available and uh, for the fishermen here in Michigan. Um, tell us about the uh, grayling that we have out here, Russ. The grayling that we have right here came from uh, about 2,500 miles northwest of us in the uh, from the Mackenzie River in the Northwest uh, Northwest Territories. Uh, some of our fellows from the Fish Division went there in May of uh, 1987 and got the eggs and they were shipped very carefully back to Canada and there were diseases for uh, checks and uh, and uh, what's, the, what's that word they use when you when you keep somebody in the house and you don't let anybody get near them? Quarantine. 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 They were put under quarantine for a little while to be carefully checked. And they're brought here in May of last year and we really had pretty good results uh, hatching and rearing the uh, railing. Here's one right here. When they become adult, they have a beautiful dorsal fin. It becomes very large and very beautiful. It would be as much in an adult as, uh, as uh, four inches high and maybe eight inches long, this big dorsal fin. It's very iridescent and beautiful. Can you see the head on the fish? The head is just basically trout light, trout light. Yep. Is there anything much in the in a color change as they get older or is they get some beautiful spots along the side. Uh -huh. They get some spots along the side. They just they just turn out to be that's their their romance I think and the uh, interest in a grayling is just their absolute beauty. And they're also a good tasting fish. And they also have another interesting aspect to them. They, they get the, the name Thymelody for the family of grilling comes from their smell, which is like the smell of the spice that we use in cooking called thyme. thyme. I know, you were mentioning a little earlier that there's been a, a disease problem here with these fish, and I noticed there are some dead fish on the bottom. Uh, what exactly is that? What happened in this way of grilling, uh, frunculosis got into this. And uh, not exactly sure, but one of the very probable uh, likely causes of that getting in here were great blue herons, which would land in other places and then come and land in this pond. They could bring the, that fish disease right in here. On their feet, probably? Or? Bring, bring it right in, and they're built. In their bill. And jab their bill in, and having jabbed into other fish that had disease, bring it right into here. So that disease is causing some fungus on the bodies, and it's causing the dorsal fin, which is really one of the uh, prettiest features on the fish to erode or rot away. It, it's caused some erosion on a number of the fins on this. In fact, it even showed on the little specimen I held up here for you. Mm -hmm. you're, you're looking at the last remnant. We've already taken several truckloads out of here. You're looking at the very last remnant in here and then some, of, some of them that are not the best in appearance. But right. A lot of them were pretty good. We heard last year that they were possibly considering a season on the fish this year, but I noticed in some of the newspaper articles that a lot of the fish have disappeared from 
many of the streams they put them in. That's what that's what we've heard is that the surveys have just shown that they just virtually disappeared from most of the streams that had other trout and other fish in them. They just aren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Any reason at all that you may think that's happened to, or? Well, two reasons. We, we, we feel that they don't compete well with other fish, and the other reason is they're completely easy, they're very easy to catch. Uh, a cast fly on the surface, they're gonna beat a trout to it and be there, and you got him right now. And probably a lot of those in the Asabo and some of our better rivers uh, were even caught a number of times, and maybe they just didn't survive those repeated catches. One word of caution to many of you sportsmen that are going to be watching. Last year, I had heard from sources from friends of mine fishing on the Manistee River that some people were hooking and keeping as many as 50 to 60 to 90 grayling in a day. And the fish, as we're told, are very easy to catch. And all of our license money goes into finally having the state bring this wonderful game fish to the state of Michigan after probably a 60-year absence. And we just ask that when the fish are planted like this, if you catch them accidentally and you hook them, please release them. There isn't an awful lot of meat on a fish that's 8 or 10 inches long, and it just appalls a lot of the sportsmen and myself in the state that many of you people were catching these fish and taking them home. Give everybody a chance. Give these fish a chance to grow and survive so that everyone one day will be able to take a chance of catching a fine grayling in the state of Michigan. station here at Wolf Lake and Russ exactly what's being done here. Okay, first of all we brought some lively popping fish and we dropped them in this water which had an anesthetic in it. Now that anesthetic calms them down so that whatever we have to do with those fish, it's much easier on them, much less stressful and a lot easier for us to do. And then these fish are going to receive a little metal tag in the nose, but that tag is so small that we first got to mark them so we'll know two or three years from now when a fisherman catches these fish that that's one of the fish that's got the little metal tag in his nose. We do this by clipping the adipose fin off right here. Now, after we mark them, they'll be passed over to the table with the machines that, that insert the little micro tags in their nose. But that little micro tag is just a slightly larger in diameter than a human hair and less than a millimeter long. It's the tiniest little thing. If I dropped one on the floor, none of us would find it unless we had a good magnet. I noticed when the fish were put in here, they were extremely lively and they tended to calm down now. Is anything added to the water to do that? Yes. 
there's a material called MS-222, and it just anesthetizes them. Less stress on the fish? Less stress on the fish, yes. At the time the fisherman catches these fish, maybe three, four years from now, mm -hmm. He'll take that head, and that'll be, those heads will be saved, and that's got that little binary coated piece of wire with all that information. In other words, information of what year, the kind of fish they were, where they were planted, what the program was. And then they'll take the core right where that is out of that head, and they'll pass it by a magnetic field, and they'll section it up until they have just that little tag. It takes about two minutes to get one of the tags out and read it. And uh, so the purpose will be to tell us what has happened to this group of fish. nose cone here and Ruth puts each fish up there this machine injects a little metal tag which is a little binary coated piece of wire that's about just slightly larger in diameter than a human hair and less than a millimeter long and it pushes it into the cartilage area of the nose and it stays with the fish for the rest of its life now and on that little tag is all kinds of information. For instance, that these are Michigan steelhead and that they're planted in, uh, that they're where they're going to be planted, so date planted, where they're going to be planted, what kind they are, and what the study's going to be. And I think this group of fish is being uh, marked to compare their survival as compared to naturally reproduced fish within a stream compared to those that are raised in a hatchery. Are any of these fish scheduled for any inland lakes at all, or is it strictly uh, streams heading out into the strictly Great Lakes? Strictly streams tributary to the Great Lakes. It's the following program demonstrating the use of coated wire tags. A binary coated wire tag is a tiny piece of wire into which notches representing numbers have been carved. The arrow points to a coated wire tag mounted on the head of a kitchen match and next to a dime. This tag is applied to fingerling salmon by implanting it into the snout of the fish where it remains throughout the animal's life. In a typical production environment, a portable trailer containing the tagging equipment is set up at a hatchery. The fish to be tagged are collected in raceways and passed into the tagging trailer. In order to make tagging easier and to minimize the effects of handling, the fish are anesthetized. Once anesthetized, surgical scissors are used to remove the adipose fin. The missing fin is used later in life to identify which fish have been coated wire tagged. Hold on, Jack. The fish are then transferred to the tag injector. The machine operator tags each fish by inserting its head into a positioning jig and pushing a button. The tagging machine automatically cuts the tag to length and using a needle inserts the tag beneath the skin into the nose cartilage of the fish. The trailer contains five tagging machines and in this production environment over 3,000 fish per hour can be tagged. Once the operator has tagged a fish, it's dropped into a water-flushed funnel and passes through a quality control device. The quality control device magnetizes the tag and then checks each fish to make certain that the tag has been properly applied. Properly tagged fish move directly into a holding tank where they recover from the anesthetic before being returned to the hatchery raceways and ultimate release. 
During the past four years, well over 100 million Pacific Coast salmon have been tagged using this system, giving the fisheries manager quantitative data by which to better manage the resource. In a mature, untagged salmon, the adipose fin is fully developed. A coated wire tagged fish is easily distinguished by its missing adipose fin. Sports fishermen are requested to inspect the adipose fin of all caught salmon. If the adipose fin is missing, the fish's head is removed and deposited in a collection bucket at a local marina. At that time, the fisherman also fills out a card indicating catch data. Deposited heads are periodically collected and sent to a laboratory where the tags are read. Commercial salmon catches are similarly screened for tags. At the reading laboratory, the nose tissue containing the tag is removed from the head. Using a magnetic sensor called a field sampling detector, the tissue is checked to see if it contains a tag. By successively cutting the tissue and retaining only the magnetic portion, the tag is quickly recovered. Once isolated, the tag is positioned into a holding fixture and placed under a microscope where it can be rotated and read. The time to recover and read a tag is approximately two minutes. Once the tag has been read, the data is entered into a computer system and analyzed. The recovery information is then returned to the facility or agency responsible for hatchery production. On the Pacific coast of North America, the binary coded wire tag has become the basic information unit for salmon management. Fishermen and non-fishermen alike often agree, 
is the walleye. A favorite sporting fish, the walleye has been increasing in numbers and availability because of sound fisheries management and improved water quality. In fact, all of our fishing is benefiting tremendously from a wise and efficient management program. Fisheries management in Michigan began in 1873 through the establishment of the Michigan Board of Fish Commission. In response to a growing scarcity of commercial fishes, the commission was given the responsibility of developing a state fish propagation site for the artificial rearing of whitefish. The fruits of their labor came quickly as the first state fish hatchery opened in Crystal Springs the following year. Eventually, 17 more were built around the state. In 1928, a Wolf Lake hatchery was established on this very site. While many of those early units have been discontinued, six modern, efficient hatcheries such as this one are meeting the fish management needs of today and the future. Wolf Lake has undergone many changes over the years. Today, it stands as one of the most modern in the country. A century of fish hatcheries experience, supplemented with new facilities, has yielded a fish cultural program second to none. Fisheries management encompasses a variety of activities. To begin with, a survey is made of a stream or lake to determine its suitability for fish. A thorough examination is made of the fish, their abundance, size, growth rate, and spawning requirements. Also scrutinized are the aquatic plants, availability of food for fish, and the state of the water with respect to quality, depth, volume, flow rate, and harmful influences. After analyzing the entire situation, a number of options for approval are available. Fish stocking is often the first improvement considered for a labor stream. Stocking may sometimes introduce a new kind of fish, but usually it's employed to maintain numbers of existing species. This is especially true for varieties such as salmon, trout, or wallow, which do not successfully reproduce. A course of follow-up survey is used to check on the success of the planting. Another fisheries management option is habitat improvement. Commonly applied practices include providing fish cover or spawning areas where lacking, and furnishing erosion control when excess sedimentation is present. Habitat improvement also involves narrowing streams and removing or modifying dams to increase flow rates and improve water quality. Erosion control is another important aspect of fisheries management. Contour farming and construction erosion control are encouraged as a means of keeping sedimentation away from streams and rivers. One of the best ways of improving lake conditions is to limit the entry of surplus nutrients from lawn fertilizers, septic seepage, animal waste, and agricultural practices. Laws and regulations pertaining to the taking of fish are vital aspects of fish management. For those fish which are few in number and highly prized, such as northern pike, laws are more restrictive. Fish which are numerous and reproduce abundantly, like bluegill and perch, have few laws regulating their harvest. In general, fish laws are designed to protect fish from overharvesting and waste. Fish population control is another widely used practice in our fisheries management program. Sea lamprey, carp, and studded bluegills are examples of undesirable fish. Elimination or reduction of their numbers improves for fishing. Fisheries research is another important part of our program. It touches all aspects of fisheries management. We investigate problems related to improving our fisheries. We determine the causes of unsuccessful reproduction of certain fish species. We assist in creating good spawning areas for desirable fish. And we conduct analysis to determine such things as the effects of changing the size limits, how to improve growth rates by eliminating undesirable fish, 
the times and sizes of woods to plant fish, and the best methods and materials to use in construction of fish cover and erosion control structures. One of our most recent fisheries projects involves successful implementation of a fish pond management system. For fish such as walleye, eggs are obtained from the adults, incubated in a hatchery, and then brought to the rearing pond as newly hatched frog. The pond provides the necessary food and shelter for their early growth, but a diet of fish is needed for their continued development. At the fingerling stage, walleye begin to swallow one another if other fish are not provided. So when the walleye reach two to three inches in length, they are transplanted from the ponds into lakes and streams, having plentiful food supplies. Northern pike spawning and rearing marshes are another example of successful artificially created fish eels. By flooding a grassy marsh or field behind a lowhead dam, we can duplicate the natural requirements for pike reproduction. These man-made marshes are needed to replace natural spawning marshes which are unknowingly destroyed by agriculture and construction. Good fisheries management involves the cooperation and support of many individuals, groups, and government agencies. Sportsmen support fish management through license dollars. Farmers contribute to the quality of fisheries habitat by controlling erosion. Industry also helps improve the state's water by regulating its effluent. And of course, interstate and international relationships are vital to good Great Lakes fish management. Success depends on the combined efforts of agencies such as the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Great Lakes Fish Commission, which represents eight states and two Canadian provinces. By working together, we have solved such problems as controlling sea leopard and the restoration of lake trout. Right here in Michigan, the State Department of Natural Resources, Divisions of Fisheries, Wildlife, Forestry, Parks, Water Quality, and Air Quality all work together to improve our waters. If you're one of the many who enjoy the challenge of sport fishing, you can thank the combined efforts of Michigan sportsmen, farmers, industry, and government. Because good fishing doesn't just happen, it's the result of quality fisheries management. For many of you sportsmen that wonder where the money goes from your licenses, this is where some of it's spent. All of these fish are future wall hangers, future record-breaking fish for the state and for all of you people to fish for. These, this operation, whether people are here 24 hours a day or not, continually goes on, as you've seen here with these automatic feeders. There's a lot of expense incurred, and there's one ton of fish in this building that we've seen today. So if you ever wonder, why am I paying this much, or why is my license money or does the state owe me something, or why do I even have to buy a fishing license? Here's where the money goes. We've come here today with our cameras, we've seen it ourselves, we've seen the great work that the people here at Wolf Lake are doing, and I think it should make all of you sportsmen extremely proud that a facility of this nature is here to create more fish, to stock more lakes, so all of us will have a chance to catch one of those wall hangers in the future. Derek again for Michigan Field. Thanks for tuning in this week. Stay with us for another exciting show next week. Hope to see you right here at the same time. Good night for now. All right, let's get